Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Romans chapter 8, the sanctification chapter in the Bible. To review slightly from last week, we're studying the adoption and presented the idea last week that the adoption, as presented in Romans by Paul, is the rapture of the church. It is the catching away of the church. It's one and the same thing as the catching away of the church. Romans 8, 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, it's fascinating to me that if you distill human needs down to the fundamental basic need. I think there's one human need that transcends all others, and that is identity. We strive for identity. We are very, very much involved with achieving a personal identity of some sort. Some people more than others. Some people want to be king of the world. We have the Donald Trumps among us, and we have various egomaniacs who want to broadcast their identities far and wide. But I think you can say that every human being wants identity. I know I do. Everybody I've talked with wants identity. What is identity, really? Well, identity, in my opinion, is integrity. Or, let's put it another way, integration. Consolidation. You want to feel like you are who you are who you are, and you are who you were who you will be. In other words, you want to feel as though you're stable, well-founded, have a lot of personal integrity. You want to feel like you are emotionally stable. You want to feel that you have properly chosen your pathway in life and that you have achieved a certain identity. It might be an identity in uh, profession. It might be an identity in function. That's what adoption is all about. Adoption is about identity. The spirit of adoption, which we have with the Father, is an identification with the Father. It's incomplete at this point. We've been adopted, but the paperwork is still in operation. Last week, someone remarked to me that they had worked in a law office a long, long time ago. During the time that a pair of twins were being adopted, they said this included a lot of paperwork, typing names over and over, and getting all the legalese just right before the days of computers, <laughs> I guess, using actual typewriters. But this involved the details of new names for these twins, new legal standing, a guarantee of various kinds of benefits that would be bestowed upon these twins, and after months and months of working with an agency, there came a day that the twins were scheduled to come to this law office to be delivered with the parents, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And the lawyer remarked that this is what it's all about. Well, that's what it's going to be like for us. We've got the paperwork. Everything has been signed and sealed. All of the agreements have been made. The protocols have been satisfied. It's just that the day of adoption hasn't come yet. We live under the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption, as we pointed out last week, involves the final deliverance from these bodies of death. It involves liberty. Romans 8, 21, the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. To wit, the redemption of our body. What is that? Well, that is the great day of the rapture. It is the day described in 1 Corinthians 15 and 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. That's the adoption, the redemption of the body. So the completion of the adoptive process, the redemption of the body, the rapture of the church, 
This will change everything, not just for us as individuals, but for the universe. The whole creation is waiting for this to be completed. Now, I know that sounds far out. I mean, when you stop and think about it, it's, it's almost unimaginable, but it's true. The rapture is the completion of the adoption. Christ is called the first fruits of those who slept. Jesus rose on first fruits on that Sunday morning after Passover, in which he became the Passover sacrifice. We are in the order of the resurrections. You know, Romans 8.24 is very interesting to me. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? You know, this is a great human theme. Think about it. Think about how this theme pervades all our lives. Think about a movie. You know, you got a hero in the movie, a hero facing a storm, being pursued by an enemy. He's hungry, he's cold, he's lost his shoes, his car's out of gas, and now he has to run across rocky ground for several miles toward a light that may or may not house the enemy. He's weak, he's sick, he's looking for a resolution of his problems. He's looking for someone to give him safety and security. Think about that guy. That is the human condition. Jason Bourne, <laughs> the Bourne identity, you know, the Bourne conspiracy. Think of the fugitive. There was a novel and a series of TV programs and a movie about the fugitive. This guy who was being pursued by a maniacal policeman, police detective, who just absolutely knew that this man had murdered his wife. But in fact, we, the audience, know this is not true at all. The fugitive is really quite innocent, and he's trying everything in this world to establish his innocence. The human condition is much like the condition of the fugitive, the hero in the storm. That's us. That's why that kind of theme is so popular. We are saved by hope, Romans 8.24. That is to say, where there's life, there's hope. Where there's hope, there's life. There's that light up ahead. Now, in the case of Christianity, our hope becomes much more visible. The whole world is like a world of fugitives. In the case of Christianity, our hope becomes very clear and very stable and very settled. And with the help of the Spirit, our faith becomes stabilized. Romans 8.25, hope. Romans 8.26, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, our weaknesses, as we're in this fugitive condition. And we all are, let's face it. The world, in general, is not a friendly place. It can be. The world can be a place of great blessing. But the world has its problems. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. This groaning condition, this Holy Spirit groaning, stenagmois, stenagmosis in the Greek, it is a laborious, continuing cry for redemption. The universe is in that condition. We're in a state of entropy, disintegration. Science calls it entropy, second law of thermodynamics. But actually, entropy is just another name for sin. When sin entered the universe, the universe began to be fractured, and the people in it were fractured. Hence the need for a Redeemer. Now, we wait for the adoption, the rapture. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Now, we're waiting, we're hoping, we're being tested, we're being tempted we come to the realization that we're in the midst of a battle. And today I want to introduce something about adoption that I think is the most important part about the spirit of adoption as it's mentioned in the Bible. Turn to Luke 2, 22, 24. Luke 22, 24. I think there's an important principle here that we need to understand. Luke 22, 24. The disciples are arguing... There was also a strife among them, which of them should be counted the greatest or considered the greatest. In other words, 
which of us 12 is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Now that seems odd, doesn't it? 12 hand-picked guys. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't you like to hear that conversation? Wow. Talk about permutations. I mean all kinds of human variability going on there. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles, they that exercise authority upon them, are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. He that is chief, as he that doth serve. For who is greater, he that sits down to eat, or he who serves? Is not he that sits down to eat, but I am among you as he that serves. Jesus said, okay, you guys argue about which of you is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Let me show you how it is. I came as a servant. He says, I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations or my trials. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath pointed unto me that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he says something interesting. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith shall fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. It boils down to this. After Jesus explains the position of things, he then points a finger at Simon, and he says, Simon, twice. By the way, in Hebrew, Peter's name, Simon, Shmaion, means to hear. It is the Hebrew verb to hear. So when he says, Shmaion, Shmaion, he's saying, listen, listen, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And I've explained in the past what I believe this sifting process to be. It's disintegration. The wheat illustrates man. The wheat is tripartite. It is a husk. It is a kernel. It's a germ corresponding to the body, soul, and spirit of man. Man is a tripartite being. Satan would love to disintegrate a man, to take him apart. This is the way Satan works. This is the way Satan teaches his minions to work. People who have written about Satan, everybody from C.S. Lewis to the various theologians who have written about the spirit world and the dark side have attempted to analyze the way Satan works among men. The way Satan works essentially is by taking you apart. Remember I said at the beginning, everybody, the prime need, the prime motivation for human beings is identity. Identity involves integrity, integration, a feeling of oneness or self-unification. Satan will come pick that apart piece by piece, and he'll take you apart. And so when he's through with you, you are in the process of disintegration. That's what Jesus is telling Peter. He'd, he'd like to sift you like wheat. He'd like to separate your germ from your kernel from your husk and just scatter you to the four winds. Jesus said, once while he was preaching, he said, Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's speaking of God. Fear God, who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And by the way, the final judgment is the destruction of the soul and the body. In a minute, we're going to talk about what that entails. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but lose his own soul? The soul in New Testament Greek is psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E. Soul is the psyche. What is the soul? Or as I once heard someone say, where is the mind? Not what is the mind, but where is the mind? Is it in the tip of your little finger? Or is it in your arm? Maybe it's in your toe. Maybe it's in your heart. Kidneys? The Hebrew word for kidneys is used in the Old Testament very often to describe the mind or the thinking process. And the ancient people had this idea that the internal organs were the seat of thought because they noticed just by primary observation that the body reacts vigorously to thinking. 
It can be aroused in various ways. It can become hysterical or quiescent, depending upon a lot of bodily functions and realities. So there seems to be a mind-body connection. What makes hell, hell? Fear God, who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. How do you destroy a soul, by the way, in hell? Well, if you read Scripture, you discover that going to hell doesn't necessarily mean the death of the soul. The soul lives on eternally and is eternally punished. On the other hand, the soul can be destroyed in hell by being disintegrated, by losing its identity, its freedom. When it finds itself in a state of bondage, with its will subverted to the will of others, so that it's absolutely in a state of bondage, slavery, the soul is destroyed. Dissolution, disintegration of the soul. The mind is enslaved, the will is enslaved, the emotions are enslaved. Identity is dissolved into unresolved anguish. You can hear the screaming of the souls in hell right now. What are they screaming about? The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, Christ, is made a quickening spirit. There is a considerable distinction made between soul and spirit. The two terms tend to be equated today, but properly, soul is not the same as spirit. In the ancient Hebrew of the Old Testament, just as in modern English, there was a word for soul, a word for spirit. The Old Testament distinguishes between these two. They have different attributes. Souls are regularly referred to in the Old Testament as having feeling or reaction. Uh, we would call it emotion. In the Old Testament, spirit is associated with doing or thinking, cogitation, but never feeling. The soul is thought to be capable of dying or experiencing death. The spirit was never referred to as having died in the Old Testament. After death, the spirit, and by the way, ancient Hebrew teaching has this, the spirit returns to God, while the soul generally winds up in Sheol where it is punished or where it awaits judgment. More than 110 times in the Old Testament where the term nephesh is used in the Old Testament for soul, it is reported to possess the attributes which today we think of as belonging exclusively to subjectively oriented, emotionally based, unconscious type things. Loving, hating, loathing, lusting, grieving, longing, mourning, that's the soul. In fact, we even use that term in the modern world. You know, what does it mean to have soul? Or what is soul singing, for example? You know what I mean? Hey, you got soul, man, soul. What is that? That is the emotional drive. Stick with me, because you're going to see how this all applies to adoption in just a minute. When our adoption is completed, the beautiful picture is amazing when you rightly understand soul and spirit. Grieving, longing, mourning, bitterness, joy, humility, thirst, desire, anguish, weariness, enjoyment, satisfaction. I've got a whole bunch of things written down here. Soul. Soul. 32 times in the Old Testament, the soul is referred to as being able to die or be cut off, or seven times it's referred to as being in the pit three times as being in hell, three times as being rent in pieces, the soul. But the spirit is said to return to God who gives it. I find this fascinating because as we look into man as a tripartite being, body, soul, and spirit, and in fact it is so named in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, by Paul, he says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. In other words, sanctification means to keep you integrated. To me, that's the most straightforward interpretation of sanctification. Keep you integrated. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's from now to the rapture. Okay? May your spirit, soul, and body 
be preserved blameless. In other words, may you remain in a state of spiritual, bodily, and emotional integrity. I have often said that the search for mental stability or mental peace has taken many pathways, but the true pathway is only to be found in Scripture. The Word of God is living, Hebrews 4.12. It is powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. Think of it, what a metaphor. The Word of God functioning as a sword to divide asunder the soul and the spirit, and the joints and marrow. Metaphorically, here in Hebrews, the writer is saying the Word of God can if you will, incisively insert itself into soul, spirit, and joints and marrow, body. Body, soul, spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you know that a new life in Christ can change you into a different person? What am I telling you? Something you don't already know. It can change you. It can make you a new person. What other system in the whole entire world can guarantee that. Oh, there are many systems that have been tried, but the Bible has a very special link up with the body, soul, spirit. In the Old Testament, Moses was instructed to make a tabernacle, which was a copy of the one in heaven. The tabernacle consisted of an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. In effect, it was a body. The outer court was the body, the inner court was the soul, and the Holy of Holies was the spirit, where God came and rested. And after the completion of the tabernacle, it remained empty of the presence of God, quote-unquote, until the Spirit of God, quote-unquote, descended and took up His abode in the most holy place. Likewise, you read in 1 Kings chapter 8 that when Solomon finished his temple, which had an outer court, inner court, Holy of Holies, when Solomon finished, the Shekinah glory entered the Holy of Holies and brought the temple to life, if you will. And the Shekinah glory was so thick that the priests were unable to do their ministry. That body came to life. The tabernacle came to life when the Spirit of God entered it. The temple of Solomon came to life when the Spirit of God entered it. Man, a tripartite being with an outer court, a body, an inner court, a soul, and a holy of holies, a spirit, doesn't come to life until the Spirit of God enters into it. His spiritual nature remains unregenerate, dead, disconnected from God until the Holy Spirit enters and takes possession of the spirit compartment of a man's nature. We call it the new birth. When a man dies, his soul and his spirit separate from his body. His body's laid in the grave, but the spirit is not bodiless. It has what Paul refers to as its psychical or its soulish body. And we see this in Scripture. The rich man and Lazarus. The rich man dies and goes to Sheol. Lazarus, the beggar who has fed off crumbs of the rich man's table, goes to Abraham's bosom. That is, he goes to paradise. The rich man, in his soulish body, by the way, he's recognizable. He recognizes others. He's able to speak. He's able to thirst, feel, talk. But he's imprisoned, and he is hopeless. His will is subverted. His personality is doomed because his spiritual nature is dead. Nevertheless, his psychical nature, his soul, remains alive in hell. Body, soul, spirit, it's kind of a uh, global model for planet Earth. A peach has a body, soul, and spirit. A peach has flesh. Inside the flesh is a stone. Inside the stone of the peach is a germ or a kernel. So it has kind of a body, soul, spirit, and it's the little germ which you put in the ground, it sprouts up and makes a new plant. A grain of wheat has the husk, the grain, and the germ. The body of a human connects with the world by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling. The soul of a human uses those tools. It uses seeing to imagine, it uses hearing to judge, to record. 
uses tastes to reason. You know, it's funny, we even speak of tastes that way. Someone has certain taste for this, someone has certain taste for that. Why there's no accounting for tastes? Why would you use sensory input data in that way? The emotions, the imagination, the judgment, the memory, the reason, desires, all associated with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. The body does all of that, the soul does the imagining. And by the way, the soul is generally described as having a mind, dianoia in Greek, that which is able to reason and grasp with in reality, a will. And will in the Greek is either thelema or bulimai. And thelema means to deeply desire something, to will to have it. Bulimai means to forcefully desire, to take something and make it yours. And the emotions described in Greek as epithumia, passions, or zelao, zealotry, powerful desires. So the soul imagines, it judges, it remembers, it reasons, it desires, it functions through the mind, the will, and the emotions, and the seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and feeling of the body. But the spirit, and only the spirit, deals with very high concepts, biblical concepts, faith, hope, reverence, prayer, worship. These are not the realm of the body or the soul. These are the realm of the spirit. Now there's something going on, and we touched on it with Jesus' pronouncement to Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. He desires to disassemble your body, soul, spirit, to disintegrate you, to disintegrate you. There's a battlefield of good versus evil in the soul of man. It's, it's not enough that the Holy Spirit should take up his residence in the spirit of man. He must also have access to the soul and the body. Not until then can a man become sanctified, as we first saw in Romans chapter 8. What we call holiness in the biblical sense is based upon a spirit-filled, if you will, spirit-filled, spirit, soul, and body. A healthy soul and a spirit need a healthy body. And if a body is given over to carnality or the lusts of the flesh, the soul and the spirit suffer, and the whole man becomes spiritually sick. Paul described this process taking place in his own life. He says, for I delight after the law of God in the inward man. He says, there's an inward man in me that delights after the law of God. That's the spirit. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. That's the soul, bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. That's the body. There's an intense wrestling match going on in the life of a believer as to which element is going to be dominant. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul reasoned that as long as he was attached to the body, he would be fighting this fight, and we all are. On a daily basis, we are fighting to possess our vessel in honor, as Paul writes in another place. It's a daily battle. But after talking about this, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he recognized there was a battle, a dichotomy going on in his person. Now, the Bible describes a soulish man, soul being psukikos, or psuke, or psyche, as we pronounce it in English, the soulish man, and by the way, the King James translates this natural, the natural man is said not to receive the things of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man, that's the soulish man, psukikos, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. We are fundamentally natural creatures who are seeking to follow Jesus and become spiritual creatures. 
I haven't perfected it. I don't know about you. I haven't perfected my movement toward Christ. I am not a perfect follower of Christ. I'm working on it on a daily basis. Psukikos, you know, psychologia, which in English means psychology. What is psychology? Well, that's another subject. But essentially, it is kind of a study of coordination of the processes that we've been describing, including everything from diverse sensory information to our interpretation of it, to various motor impulses, speeding up of the heart, slowing down of the heart, gasping for breath, <gasps> you know, sighing, <sighs> the back of the hand to the forehead, oh man, I've been there, done that, right? All these motor, these sensory inputs and these motor processes. Oh, it's just too much someday. I just want to go back to bed. That's psychology. <laughs> Psychoanalysis. We've all heard, you know, that term used. We've laughed at it. I think of Fraser Crane. But psychoanalysis, what's it all about? It's about a well-balanced psyche. The attempt to make a psyche whole and and well integrated, and it has its own language, it has a strange language. It talks about things like id, ego, and superego. It talks about the self and self-esteem, and it talks about self-criticism, and it talks about all kinds of wonderful fragmentations that can occur, and the restoration of those personal fragmentations. But it all boils down to what? What did we just say uh, earlier as we started out? What's man's chief desire? Identity. A well-documented, stable identity. Do you know that Eastern religions teach something very interesting? They teach the division of consciousness. They teach that there are those people who are somehow spiritually mature, whether, re whether they've gone through like thousands of reincarnations and had lots of practice and become old souls or whatever. But before that, Eastern religion teaches that at death, there is a division of consciousness. That is to say, the body, the unconscious soul, the conscious spirit of a man can be, and usually are, divided by death. This seems like an alien thought to Western minds, but Eastern religion does teach the division of consciousness at death. Eastern religion becomes focused on how to live so as to avoid being split apart at death. And to make it as simple as possible, the focus is on self-actualization, some sort of discipline, some sort of learned set of behaviors that can bring you to such a state of personal integration that you can survive death's door and go on over to the other side in a whole fashion, body, soul, and spirit. And only the spiritual adepts of the East are said to be able to do that. Well, I got news for you. In Christ, you're going to do that. You don't need to lie on a bed of nails. You don't need to learn deep breathing or strange and weird postures or self-denial. No, all you need to do is follow the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to go body, soul, and spirit, by the way, in an improved form, and you're going to follow Jesus without having to ring the bells and blow the whistles. You are going to attain what? identity. And that's the beautiful part of it. People have tried it all. Every form of religion you can think of, uh, psychoanalysis, Freud, Jung, behavioral psychology, psychology of learning, self-actualization, transpersonal psychology, existential models. Anybody ever hear of Carl Jung? I looked up a quote, and I found a quote from Carl Jung, who was raised the son of a pastor, by the way, in Germany. And he wrote about a communion experience he had at church. He said, and I quote, 
slowly I came to understand that this communion had been a fatal experience for me. It had proved hollow. More than that, it had proved to be a total loss. I knew that I would never again be able to participate in this ceremony. Why, this is not religion at all, I thought. It is an absence of God. The church is a place I should not go. It is not life which is there, but death." End quote. That's Carl Jung reacting to communion. Well, he started out on a different way. Communion. What do you suppose he was looking for in communion? Well, what do we all look for in communion? We look for a relationship with God, a way to ascertain that we are in close, vital communion with the living God, okay? When I take the elements of the Lord's Supper, I have no problem in incorporating that metaphor as representing a real relationship that I have with God. I have no problem with that at all. Carl Jung had a problem. But remember what we read a minute ago, the natural man, 1 Corinthians 2.14, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Psychikos, natural. The psychic man, if you will, the soulish man, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.16 goes on to say this, Who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In other words, because of spiritual rebirth, just as I mentioned a minute ago, our whole body, soul, and spirit have been vitally restructured initially by a baptism. The baptism of the Spirit opens a formerly closed spiritual portal. And then subsequent to that, we become more and more and more godlike in our perceptions and our behavior and we have access to the mind of Christ. Natural, psychikos, belonging to the psyche, the lower part of the immaterial man, whereas pneumatikos, the spiritual man, is using the higher function of his immaterial nature. Let's go back to what Jesus said to Peter. Peter, Shmaon, Shmaon. Satan would like to take you apart like a grain of wheat, the husk and the kernel and the germ, and just throw them to the winds. Satan would like to blur your identity, your freedom, your well integrated sense of self, as related to the Creator God, with whom you will be co regent for eternity. I'm speaking to all of you now. In Christ, we're going to rule and reign with Christ in glorified bodies. And we haven't gotten to the good part yet. About five more minutes. The good part is coming. The really good part's coming. Satan would divide your consciousness. Do we have evidentiary um, historical examples of such division of consciousness? Well, look at the madmen of the world. Look at people who do mad, strange things. Why would somebody walk into a room full of people and shoot a bunch of them and then kill himself? For what reason? Well, no reason. Satan would blur your identity. He would cause you to act in ways that remove your own freedom and then subsequently act in ways to try to justify the removal of your freedom. He would destroy your well-integrated sense of self as related to the Creator God. He would divide your consciousness. He would disintegrate you. He would take away your identity. Christ, through the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Advisor, Paraclete is an interesting word, parakaleo, to come alongside and counsel. You know, the Holy Spirit acts not only as our legal representation before God, but he also acts as our, if you will, counselor. You got a problem? You talk to your counselor. Well, that's strange. Well, yeah, to the world, that is strange. But he wants to bring you whole as a wholly integrated person into the kingdom where you will have a new name. 
a new legal standing and future benefits when your adoption is completed. Isaiah 62.2, of the Gentiles, this is speaking of Israel, the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, this is in the kingdom, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Israel is going to have a new name one of these days in the kingdom. That name will reflect the Israel that has gone through thousands of years of trials and tribulations and is finally lifted up in the kingdom. Revelation 2.17. Ooh, that's interesting. Before we get to that, however, turn to Revelation chapter 2 and let's look at the seven churches and the promises made to each of the seven churches and see how that relates to our study today. Because the seven churches are churches, each of which receives a blessing for having overcome the world. And the blessings are a totality. That is to say, I think that the blessings that we read are to be taken as parts of a whole blessing. Revelation 2, the church at Ephesus. Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh. Who is the overcomer? The overcomer is the one who survives, who thrives, until the adoption is complete at the rapture of the church. He's resurrected in a glorious body. And to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life is immortality. It is eternality. And by the way, the Bible measures eternality not as a span of time, but as an existing condition. Eternal life, whether you talk about the Old Testament proclamations of eternal life or the New Testament, it's not time you're talking about here. You're talking about quality eternal life, eating of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And you remember the new Jerusalem has the tree of life. In it, the tree of life was in the garden, and it would have been accessible to Adam and Eve had they not sinned. Second blessing to the church at Smyrna, verse 11 of chapter 2, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. There will be no subsequent judgment after the initial resurrection. No second death. No judgment. So you'll have immortality, eternal life, and you'll also have a perfection about you that transcends judgment. You will not be judged by God. Think about that condition. That's remarkable. Thirdly, third church, message to Pergamos, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, spiritual food. Heaven only knows what the hidden manna is. But I suspect that it gives you qualities, uh, perhaps perceptual qualities that you do not now have, perhaps physical qualities. And I'll give him a white stone. Oh, well, that's nice. And in the stone, a new name written. And I've said for years, I cannot wait to get my white stone. I just really, really, I'm clinging to the hope of one day receiving my white stone. I don't even know what it looks like. How big it is, you know? What, is it the size of a bar of soap? Or it, is it a little stone that hangs on a thing around your neck? Do you wear it on your wrist? I don't know. Is it a uh, multi-gigawatt transceiver, GPS, eternal homing device for God that contains all the information of the universe and enables its wearer to do all kinds of wonderful things like walk through walls. I don't, I don't know what the white stone is, but it's got my new name written in it. Now, that means that my stone is my personal stone. It has my identity in it. I don't even know the name. He's going to write the name what is that name? Identity. It's what everybody's after. Identity. Here it is, it's given an absolute physical figure. A white stone with your new name written in it. Everybody can imagine that. I can't wait to find out what the white stone is. But it has to do with identity. 
a new name. Okay, go to the next one now. Thyatira. Verse 26 of chapter 2. He that overcometh keepeth my works to the end. To him will I give power over the nations. That's co-regency with Christ. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my father, I will give him the morning star. A part of the new order of the universe. Because the morning star is an Old Testament figure that has to do with the original creation of the universe. When the morning stars sang together, okay? To receive the morning star means to receive a part in the new creation, which we read about at the end of the book of Revelation. So I'm going to give you power over the nations. I'm going to give you the morning star. Wow. A part in the new order of the universe. Look at the church of Sardis, verse 5 of chapter 3. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. White clothing is the emblem of righteousness in the Bible. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. What is the book of life? It is your genome, I think your human DNA structure, both in its present state and in its glorified state is already written in the book of life. Plus, all of the events of your life, it is a history of your life, probably past, present, and future. And the Lord has written part of that book. You've written part of that book by the things you've done. Your activities are entered in that book, and it's going to be reviewed one of these days. But your name's not going to be blotted out of that book. And Jesus says, I will personally confess his name before my Father, before his angels, so, you're going to have eternal citizenship, that's identity, and the name of God. I will confess His name before my Father. You're going to have the name of God and the name of the city of God. Look at verse 12, the Philadelphian church, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. You know what that is? Identity. If you're a pillar... In the temple of God, you have a solid 100% unending eternal identity with everything that God is. Because we learned at the end of the book of Revelation that the Son and the Father and the Spirit are the temple. And if you become a pillar in that temple, that's a metaphoric way of saying that you are perfectly identified with the temple of God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. Not only will you have a new name, but you'll have the name of God written on you. And the name of the city of my God. You'll have a place, a citizenship. What does that mean? What does citizenship mean? Well, just think about your life, your passport, your driver's license, your papers, your birth certificate. Suppose somebody just stripped you of everything and took away all your papers and dropped you in some small village in Siberia and you can't speak the language. Who are you without your citizenship, without your identification? You're nobody. You're nobody. The whole thrust of the adoption is identification. Just as we said a minute ago, after all the papers are filed, after everything is signed, sealed, then comes the day of adoption, the papers are stamped, everything is done complete, it's in order, you're adopted, you not only have a new name, you have all of the official documents that certify you as a new person. That is the adoption. You're going to get the new name of the Lord written upon you. And finally, in verse 21 of chapter 3, to him that overcometh, well, I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Not only will you have the identity of the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the temple, the city of God, but you are going to have absolute fellowship with the Lord through eternity. Now that's what I call adoption. I can't wait. I am groaning along with all of you together until now waiting for the adoption.